Good morning. It is good to be with you in worship today. There are a few announcements for you today. If you would like to come and play pickleball, I assume the pickleballers are pickleballing. Is that right, Doc? At 1.30? And so if you would like to come and play pickleball, please feel free to do so there in the Family Life Center. But uh, we do want to make the announcement about pickleball that on June the 4th, the Sunday afternoon session will begin at 2.30 instead of 1.30, and that'll be its normal time starting at 2.30 on Sundays. Uh, pickleball will meet at its normal time throughout the week this week. We want to say a thank you, a special thanks to everybody who came out and helped uh, pull off the men's fish fry. It was a wonderful time. Uh, I think everybody who came left with a, a full stomach. We had a great crowd, uh, but wanted to say thank you to, to Mike Painter and all the folks who have put that together and Davis and Linda for hosting and everybody who was just there. It was, good. it was good to have everybody there in that place. This week, we have our men's breakfast group on Tuesday morning at Skip's. And that'll be at 6.30 in the morning. The men's evening uh, Wednesday night group will meet in the chapel. And then the Wednesday night women's Bible study are going to meet for dinner on Wednesday night at 5.30 at Drafts and Watercrafts. And so there are several opportunities to get involved with things this week. And so we hope that you will take advantage of them. Just to let you know, the office is going to be closed tomorrow in observance of Memorial Day. And so if you call up here, just leave us a message and we will get it. It is good and wonderful to be with you in worship. Our hymn of greeting this morning is Holy Spirit, Thou Art Welcome. It's number 387. Let's stand as we sing together. Holy Spirit, Thou art welcome in this place. Holy Spirit, Thou art welcome in this place. Omnipotent. Please turn, welcome your neighbor to church on this beautiful Sunday morning. Hear our call to worship. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, is the word of the Lord to the prophet. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old shall dream dreams, and your young shall see visions. Please join me in our invocation. Holy God, like a rushing wind, your spirit moved upon the first disciples on the day of the Pentecost with a message of salvation. Send your spirit upon your church in this time. Stir up our courage and rouse up for perfect that we may join with them to proclaim to the world your mighty deeds of power in Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's continue to worship together as we sing number 389 and 390. We'll sing the verses that have the black arrows beside them. Oh. 
be seated. Hear our call of confession. God has promised that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Therefore, let us call upon the Lord, confessing our sins. Please join me in our prayer of confession. God of new creation, we confess that we have failed to trust your goodness. We hoard earth's resources and refuse to share your gifts. We withhold our charity to those in need. We deal harshly with our enemies. We severely judge the sins of others. Forgive us, renew our hearts, and free us from our sins. Amen. Hear our assurance of pardon. Friends, God offers forgiveness of our sins and the grace of repentance. Accept God's grace, repent of your sin, and be restored to abundant life. Isn't it great to be in the house of the Lord this morning? I am so thankful to this church, this church family, for keeping me around for 28 years. Today begins my 29th Sunday or year uh, with this church family. And 29 years ago, this younger, more black-headed young man came to this church, and this is what he's saying. My pages are messed up up here. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely? 
and long for heaven and home. When Jesus is my portion, my constant friend is he. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free, for his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Let not your heart be troubled, his tender word I hear. And resting on his goodness, I lose my doubts and my fears. Though by the path he leadeth, but one step I may see, his eye is on the sparrow. And I know he watches me. His eye is on the sparrow. And I know he watches me. Whenever I am tempted, Whenever clouds arise, when song is placed to sighing, when hope within me dies, I draw thee closer to him. From care he sets me free. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free, for his eye is on that sparrow, and I know he watches. Thank you, Steve, and thank you, Linda. Over the past several weeks, we have been highlighting some of our missionary work, uh, both uh, that happens in different countries and some that originated out of here, uh, the Rainies again. Uh, it, just to tell you, if you didn't catch the news, the Rainies are going to be back with us on the 23rd of July to give us an update about their work going to the Dominican Republic. And uh, Casey and I have been talking already about uh, our possible mission trip there next summer, uh, taking high schoolers and those who'd like to accompany us down there uh, in next summer uh, of 2024. So uh, today is our last Sunday to highlight one of our missionaries, and today it is about James Tomba. Uh, this is our last missionary to tell you about. You may have heard James's name before from the times that we have spoken to the congregation about helping him with monetary support in his work in Liberia. Uh, and so we are going to watch a bit of his story this morning, and so I'm going to direct you to the screen.
if you'd like to know some more about James's ministry in Liberia, Lisa's, Lisa and Davis, and there's others who are always willing to, to share about what his ministry is in Liberia. James asks for these prayer concerns. Please pray for him and his ministry in Liberia. We thank God for the children there in Liberia that will come to know Jesus and thrive. That healing would continue to take place from the terrible pain caused by two civil wars and the devastation caused by Ebola and COVID. Please pray for the leaders of Liberia that they will know God's word and live by it with integrity and that all the people of Liberia, but especially the children, will be restored after the devastation of war. These were James's prayer concerns that he has shared with us and he asked for us to pray for. In addition to those prayers, we ask you to continue to remember Kevin Grant. Kevin is continued, uh, he's continued in his stay at St. Thomas Rutherford. Uh, he is in step down now out of ICU. Uh, got to see him this past week. Um, got to have a meal, uh, which has been uh, kind of uh, not happened recently. Uh, so please keep him in your prayers. He continues to recover from that infection, which, which landed him there. We also ask your continued prayers for Kathy Craig, Gary Muma, George King, Matthew Ratcliffe, Nancy Lewis, and Mason Baggett, who are all recovering from surgeries or just in, are in need of prayer for medical reasons. We do have a praise in our church family. If you are to run into May Hyden, uh, May turns 95 today. And so if you see May, wish her a happy birthday. Please continue to remember Pat Smith, Kevin Seiler, Laura Arnold, Don Gibson, Debbie Bloomfield, Pam Peck, and others who are affected by cancer, and Howard Hall's niece uh, who is under hospice care. Especially this weekend, we ask you to remember those families and those who have lost their lives in service to others. Please remember their family and friends who continue to remember them even though they have died in service. And lastly, a note that I've forgotten to mention, Michael Mullen, that is Anna's uh, oldest son, uh, Michael broke a hip. Uh, Michael suffers from rheumatoid, rheumatoid arthritis. He is maybe in his mid-upper 20s, um, and so he has a, quite a few things going on. But please keep Michael in your prayers as he is awaiting surgery to help him for his hip. Are there others this morning? Then let's pray. We give you thanks, O oh God, for this day you have blessed us to have. We ask you to be with our many prayer concerns, but be especially, God, with our missionaries. Be with them wherever they are. Be with them in their work, in their struggles, in their praises. Lord, we just lift them up to you because it is not easy to be separated from family and friends to serve in a, in a foreign land, on a different field. And so we pray for them. We pray for those who have been devastated by war, who have been affected in so many different ways now and for years and decades to come. Lord, we pray for the work. We give you thanks for the friendships that began in this place with James Tomba and Jonathan Clark and that they continue now 20 years later. Be with our many prayer concerns. Be with Kevin as he continues to be in the hospital. Those who are recovering from surgeries and those who are facing down medical procedures and plans. Be with those whose lives and journeys may be coming to their conclusion. And may we lift up today all those who in the service uh, to their brothers and sisters lost their lives. We pray for their families and their friends who continue their memory. And Lord, be with us. Be with the prayers we speak aloud. Be with the prayers we hold inside. And bless us so that we might bless others. Be with us even now as we pray the great prayer that you taught your disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. On this Pentecost Sunday, thus the red that you see here in the sanctuary we look to its text in Acts 
2. And there I'll be reading the first 13 verses of Acts chapter 2. Hear now, my friends, the word of God. When the day of Pentecost had came, had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly from heaven there came the sound of the rush, like a rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now, there were devout Jews from every people under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at the sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered. Because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these speaking Galileans? And how is it that each we hear, each of us we hear in our own native language, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya beyond, belonging to the Serene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arab in our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. My friends, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So our leader says to me, here, you may need this. As we exited the vans, the snow and the slush, it crunched under our boots as we exited the vans and as we gathered everybody for our instructions. We had driven our mission team in Alaska to this eh, semi-remote spot, maybe not too bad. We had gone to this place so that we could see some of the natural beauty of Alaska and we were going on a hike. Not a long hike, about three quarters of a mile back through the woods on this trail to see a waterfall. Everybody was good. Everybody had the instructions, knew what to do, knew what was going on. And as a group, we began to make our way to the trailhead to begin the winding back through the woods. And as we did, before we got going, the trip leader came over to me with a cherry red canister about the size of a water bottle and had a nozzle on the end of it. And she says to me, here, just in case. I know the look that I gave her. The look that I gave her is somewhere at the intersection of confusion, skepticism, and, well, let's call it contemplative fear. Turning the canister around, the words in black and white on the label in 45 font, bear spray. It works good on moose too, the leader told me. To which my reply was, well, of course it would. There were a lot of folks hiking back and forth on the trails. There was even a, a young woman with a photographer, which I thought was a bit odd because she was dressed like she was going to the club, not going to the waterfalls. And when asked about all this foot traffic and the probability of running into some of these, uh, the local wildlife, the leader assured me, that this was still the bear and the moose, meese, mooses, it doesn't matter. It was still their habitat, not ours. I think she even told me that the bear spray I was holding, she said, it's kind of like wasp shot. It shoots a long stream. And I thought, yeah, just for a bigger and furrier wasp, you know. Thankfully, we saw no bear, nor did we see any moose that day. And as we're hopping back into the vans, I was tickled just to hand her back the spray and thank her for thinking of us. But I guess a lesson was learned that day, a lesson, you know, because we always jump out of vehicles and are handed bear spray. 
But I, you know, I have a lesson that I took from that. And, and you know, I may not know when the best time to prepare uh, is to meet a moose or a bear, but I can tell you when it's not. The best time to meet a bear or a moose is not when you meet a bear or a moose. You feel free to take that one with you. Share it wherever it might be applicable. The best time to prepare to meet a bear or a moose is not when you meet the bear or a moose. Be prepared. It sounds familiar because for over 100 years it's been associated with the Boy Scouts. Brian Wendell wrote in 2017, upon hearing the Scout motto, somebody asked the founder, Robert Baden-Powell, an inevitable question. Prepared for what? Baden-Powell said, why for any old thing? He, 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 in 1907, an English soldier devised the Scout motto, be prepared. It was published in Scouting for Boys in 1908. Two years later, in 1910, the Boy Scouts of America would be founded. But in Scouting for Boys, Baden-Powell wrote that to be prepared means that you are always in a state of readiness in mind and body to do your duty. The article continued, but Baden-Powell wasn't just thinking about first aid and wartime. He coined the motto, his idea. His idea was that scouts should prepare themselves to be productive citizens and strong leaders and to bring joy to other people. He wanted each scout to be ready in mind and body and in heart for whatever challenges might await them. Even to this day, the highest honor in scouting is the Eagle Scout, and the accompanying medal has an eagle with BSA on it, a red, white, and blue ribbon, but at the top of the medal, on a scroll it looks like, are the two words, be prepared. And you might be wondering, what does bear spray and the Boy Scouts have to do with Pentecost? And if that's you, I don't blame you one bit. It was a confusing time for the disciples when Jesus had left them in the first century. Jesus, at this point, has ascended to heaven. And here are the leaders of Christianity, although it is not called Christianity at the time. And they have all gathered in one place. Pentecost has come. It was 50 days since the resurrection. And they were all together waiting on the one to come whom Jesus spoke to them about. In John's gospel, four different times Jesus spoke to them about one who would come to help them when he had left. But it broke, it, it kind of, I don't know, it, it led me to ask the question. How do you wait on the Spirit of God? I know that may be odd to ask, but it's just what came to mind. How do you wait on God's Spirit? Jesus really didn't give the disciples a time frame. The Holy Spirit's going to show up on Tuesday at 8.59. Jesus didn't give them a day, a year, a month, or anything like that. So how do you wait on the Spirit of God in this, this image of a, of a young person sitting in class watching the clock count down to the end of the day came to mind. Any of y'all remember those days when you would just look at the clock? You know, back in the dark ages when you had the seconds hand that would go around and at the end of the day you're just watching. About every other minute you look back as if time suddenly had jumped forward even more. Just waiting for that moment to arrive. And so now the disciples are together and they are in one place. The advocate, the Holy Spirit. Is it time? Is it time? Kind of like the kids in the car. Are we there yet? Is it time for the Spirit to arrive? When the Spirit does arrive, though, there is no question. The sound of a violent wind, it says, came crashing down into the place where they were, in the room where they had gathered. And a divided tongue rested on each of them. And all of them began to speak in different languages as they were given utterance. This isn't the Holy Spirit knocking at the door saying, can I come in? No, this is the Holy Spirit that breaks in, fills everybody up past the brim until you can't do anything else but overflow. The advocate, the Holy Spirit has come. So now they start doing the work. 
They've been given the Spirit, and now they start uttering the good news. They start speaking about God's deeds of power and the words about that community because that community was not ready. But here's how they are described. Bewildered, amazed, astonished, and perplexed. They describe the crowds as the preaching is going on. They are from all over, and the languages they hear are from all over. How could these folks know? Know all that they know and be able to communicate it with all these different people? How? And wouldn't you know it, it is right there in the story. You may not have caught it, but it's right there in the story when the bear shows up. Now, don't don't flip back in the scriptures and don't wonder what translation is he reading. There is not an actual bear. But if there were an actual bear in the story of Pentecost, this is where he would show up. Or, Or she. When the people are amazed and perplexed and astonished and bewildered, a question comes walking down the path, a big old furry question, what does this mean? The sound of a violent wind, the disciples preaching, preaching in different languages, the question comes from the crowds. And the only thing the disciples need to be worried about at this moment is this. Do you have a cherry red canister ready to go? Because if you remember the words of wisdom, and I hope you do, you don't prepare to meet a bear or a moose when you meet the bear or the moose. You don't prepare to meet the Holy Spirit and what it's going to do when it shows up. You prepare ahead of time. When the question comes looming down the path, We know one group's ready to go, the cynics, the critics, the naysayers, the ones who comment on product reviews and social media posts, they're ready to go. When the question comes from the crowds, they grab their canister and they say, they're drunk. They're drunk. That's why they're speaking in a bunch of these different tongues. That's why we can't understand them like they are. They are drunk. The cynics and the critics and the naysayers, they have that canister ready to go in every generation for things that do not fit perfectly into the prefabricated mold. If something is new, I'm sorry, it's not old enough. If it's old, well, I'm sorry, it's just not new enough. If it's too bright, ooh, it's too shiny. If it's not shiny enough, you know, it's kind of dull. If it's something that has not been done, well, you know, we've never done it that way here before. And if it's something beyond all that you can can kind of encompass and understand, well, then the naysayers are going to do what they can to make you hate it, be scared of it, or they are going to try to get you and I to disregard it by explaining it all away like they're drunk at 9 in the morning. That's how they deal with a question like that coming down the path. And so here are the people, here are people who are vulnerable, they are seeking, they are questioning, they are wondering, and they have experienced the work of the Holy Spirit, they have heard the good news internally, they are these scales that are waiting in a balance, and which way they're going to go depends on, depends on who grabs the spray, depends on who strikes, the epitome might be the epitome of the phrase, who strikes while the iron is hot. In every culture, we have a a lexicon of words and phrases that are a generation or two from being lost. I love phrases like this, like keeping your nose to the grindstone. You know, that actually has origins in milling. You would keep your nose to the grindstone to make sure it wasn't getting too hot. Therefore, when you were milling, things would not, you know, explode. Things like, and expressions like dead as a doornail. You may not know where that, that phrase came from. It came from building. When they would drive a nail through wood and the nail head would be, the pointy end would be sticking through and so you didn't want to hit yourself and and stab yourself with the nail head, they would take a hammer and they would strike the pointy end of the nail and when they did, they called that killing the nail, thus dead as a doornail. But to strike while the iron is hot came from blacksmithing. To strike while the iron is hot meant that that iron had to be hot and you can only form it and shape it when you strike it. But the iron has to be hot. You can't strike cold iron and it do anything. 
So one must strike while the iron is hot. These people are at the point where someone is going to shape them. Somebody is going to shape these people who are asking this question. It's just a matter of whom. Thankfully, the naysayers are not the only one ready to go. They're not the only one prepared to meet the bear. In verse 14 it says, But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowds. The disciples have been preparing too. They were preparing when they were around with Jesus. They saw Jesus when he was healing and doing his miracles. He, they saw him as he addressed the crowds and people who wondered and were amazed. They've been with him and, and they weren't, when he left, just sitting around twiddling their thumbs. Chapter 1 says that they devoted themselves to prayer. It says they replaced Judas. They began preaching like Peter. So when all of a sudden, down the path comes this bewildered, amazed, and, 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 and wonderful question. When the iron is hot, it says, Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. He refutes the critics. He takes what's happening and he connects it to the Old Testament prophecy. He connects it to Jesus. He connects it to what they are doing in light of the resurrection and to which he says in verse 32, and of that we are all witnesses. He was ready too. And what happened? It says, now when the crowds heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ and so your sins may be forgiven and you will receive the Holy Spirit and the scriptures say that day, about 3,000 were added to their number. Think about it for just a moment. What happens if the disciples are not prepared when the Spirit comes? What happens when the Spirit comes and all of these things begin happening and the crowds are looking at Peter and the other disciples, apostles, and they say, what does this mean? What happens if they're not ready? Does Peter just look at them and say, I don't know, you got me. What happens if they aren't ready to point them in the direction of God? If they are not ready, the critics get to frame what's happening and it all gets explained away to alcohol consumption that one morning. The iron cools. It will not be shaped by the apostles if they are not ready. The moose runs over them. If a God thing happened to you, would you be able to share it and maybe explain it to someone? If a God event happened in a community somewhere, would you be able to maybe connect it somehow to Scripture or the good news or Jesus or the work that has been going on in the great cloud of witnesses? The motto of the scouts lent to this explanation. In the scouts, you are always in a state of readiness in mind and body to do your duty. Well, I guess the Christians should be always in a state of readiness in mind and body and spirit to point somebody towards God. We need to be devoted in prayer. We need to be in our scriptures. We need to be somehow part of a, of a faith study deepening in our faith. We need to make ourselves available if somebody needs to talk. It's kind of like meeting a bear or a moose. The worst time to get ready to meet somebody with a faith question is when you meet somebody with a faith question. 
So perhaps we need to take a page from the Boy Scouts and be prepared. Would you pray with me this morning? We thank you, to, we thank you God, that you have given us the ability to be prepared. Today, as we hear the story of Pentecost, and we read about how the disciples, the apostles, were ready when the question came, help us to do likewise. Help us to be your people, singing your praise, ready to go when the Spirit shows up in someone's heart. Bless us to be a blessing. We ask these things in your Son's name. Amen. This morning, our hymn of commitment is Holy Spirit, Light Divine. It's number 392. Would you stand as we sing together? Please join me in our affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Hear our call to give. With thanksgiving for God's gifts to us, let us offer ourselves and the fruits of our labor for God's work in the world. there be peace 
peace on earth, and let it begin with me. Let there be peace on earth, the peace that was meant to be. Please stand for our benediction. May the grace of God bless you with peace. May the love of Christ sustain you in joy. And may the power of the Holy Spirit fill you with courage this day and forevermore. Let's all join together as we proudly sing number 799, the first verse of America the Beautiful, as we remember those that we have lost. skies for amber waves of gray for purple mountain majesties above the fruited plain America America God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining 